I wanted to start, Rochelle, with the topic that, of course, you talk a lot, but I think it's still, we are not discussing enough. So what does birth is actually doing to a woman? What, what is the effect, the deep effects it has? Birth imprints us for life, right? So as the woman, as the mother giving birth, and as the baby being born, our experience of that birth is going to mark us for life. And so as the baby coming in, there's different ways to say it. One of my dear friends, an elder midwife, her name's Wapio, and she talks about from ancient Egyptian midwifery that the way that it was explained, it was like when we're in our mother's wombs, um, the music is being recorded. And then when we're born, we're just playing out the music that was already recorded from being in the womb. Mm -hmm. So in pre and perinatal psychology, they would say the same thing, just using different language, right? That how we are responding to life, our construct um, is really shaped by our experience in the womb, which is shaped by our mother's felt experience of when she was pregnant, right? So birth is the culmination of this experience of the imprinting of the future generations, right? So it's like a mother-baby participation. Mother is baby's first environment because everything that mother feels, the baby is going to feel. And then that is going to form who that baby is, like on a biochemical level. And Mm -hmm. For a mother, her birth, our births, we'll remember them for the whole of our lives, right? Our births imprint us. And I feel like the the design of birth is that it's meant to imprint us with um, a complete expansion of our capacities, with um, that felt sense of, as a woman, I can do anything, mm-hmm. Um And with a felt sense of like birthing ourselves into um, the honor, the honorable role of mother and the Mm -hmm. dignity and the self-respect that should be coupled with what it means to be a mother, right? Like that's the design. And that happens when there's physiologic birth, when a woman feels through her birth, that she came through that deeply fulfilled, deeply connected, nourished, and in her own power, right? So that's Mm -hmm. the the design. It's not what's happening for a lot of women, right? So (laughs) what's happening for a lot of women is like coming through birth, traumatized and disoriented and quite opposite of feeling in our power. It's feeling disconnected from who we are feeling disempowered um and so like that but the design the physiologic design when women are able to birth um in an environment that is supportive and conducive to our physiology which is a felt sense of safety um, a felt sense of privacy an environment that nourishes all of our senses you think about an environment in which you would want to make love in It's the environment Mm -hmm. that is necessary to give birth in. So when birth can happen within that kind of context, because that is actually like the quote unquote safest birth could ever be. People always want to talk about the safety of birth. But when we understand that there's an actual design for birth and the way that we support that design or not creates an environment of safety or not for birth to happen. So you know, a felt sense of safety, privacy, um, darkness, um, having um, like witnesses with you, but not being observed, right? Because there's a Mm -hmm. difference there. Feeling nourished, but not being meddled with. This This is what is required for physiologic birth to happen. And when it does happen like that, even it doesn't mean to say that the birth is going to be quote unquote easy or that it's going to look a certain way. But that is the environmental construct that places a woman in the center of her own experience and what Mm -hmm. gives us the potential for a beautiful imprinting. 
in our entrance into motherhood. Yeah, I'm just thinking and remembering uh, right straight away my own birth, like uh, mm -hmm. what it was. And I think I was lucky enough to have a little bit of privacy and darkness, uh, despite the fact that I was in the hospital. So that was, but it, it required a lot of effort from people around me, to be honest, mm -hmm. it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about And you were saying that it's not, this is the design, but it's not what is happening for many, many women right now. And sort of, we like, we still live in the given circumstances, I believe. And we need to, this is our role, like we need to try to find the way to be as close to what is, you know, nature man, to what our needs are, but in a given life, in a given you know world. So how women could prepare herself I don't know I wouldn't say in the best in the best possible way but just in a way that again will help her to gain from this experience to get some treasures from and gifts from it um, not uh, only the traps and pitfalls I mean if we're really going to talk about like where do we begin with this You know, our life as a woman is a continuum, right? So each stage is building on the next. And there's a lot of different ways to explain it. In Chinese medicine, they talk about how as women, we move through seven-year cycles. Seven-year cycles mm -hmm. of Jing or life essence energy. So zero to seven, seven to 14, 14 to 21. And in whatever way we want to look at it, just in human life, our experiences go forming us, Right. So as a little girl growing up within our respective cultural context, as a little girl growing up within this collective cultural context, what kind of information are we learning about who we are as girls and young women and what it means to be a girl and a young woman on this planet? What are we learning about our own bodies and how we're learning about who we are as a girl, as a young woman, is through our mom, first mm -hmm. and foremost. So what way does our mother take care of her own womanly self? What kind of relationship does our mom have to her own body, to her own genitals, to her own sexuality, to her own sensuality? What is our mother's own relationship to her bleeding each month? Are we growing up in an environment where it's normal and natural and we're seeing our mother's bleed you know and it's part of we know her monthly cycle and we see our mothers resting during that time or are we growing up seeing our mothers shove tampons up their vaginas when they're bleeding and go on with life as normal and maybe take some aspirin because they have cramps and there's no pause you know so it's like What is the information that's going to our girls from an early age about how to be a woman and what does it mean to be a woman? And then if we bring the men in, in what ways are the men, meaning the fathers, treating the mothers? How are they taking care of them or not? How are they talking to them or not? Because the men are giving the examples to our daughters of what kind of men they're gonna end up getting together with, okay? Mm -hmm. So an easy way to think about it for the men is, am I being the kind of man that I want my daughter to marry? And mm -hmm. if the man is not, it's like an easy way to look at how can I change, right? So that's from the man's perspective and from the woman's perspective is, Am I in a relationship with my body, with myself, that I want my daughter to mirror, that I want my daughter to imitate? And that is the entrance point to birth. Because what's happening is that we're being educated from birth, okay? We're, we're born into a medicalized system that separates, that sterilizes, that does all of these things. And then we're conditioned mm -hmm. by our respective and collective cultures about what it means to be in a female body so that by the time most of us arrive to birth, we're disconnected from our bodies, we're disconnected from our vulvas, from our vaginas, from our womanly parts. Um, we have sterilized ourselves 
either literally or metaphorically, right? Maybe we've been on birth mm-hmm. control pills from the time we were 13 years old or some other form of hormonal birth control. Um, we're disconnected from our cycles. We're disconnected from the cycles of the earth. We, we have had period cramps our entire life and we don't even know that it's simple actually to change that. So we arrived to birth thinking that instead of our bodies know how to do this and this is going to be a beautiful experience mm-hmm. that this is something that needs to be managed and we don't know anything about it and it definitely needs intervention in order to be quote unquote safe because we don't feel mm-hmm. safe in our own bodies. That's mm-hmm. like foundationally what it is, right? We don't feel safe in our own bodies as women. So how can we arrive to birth and feel safe in one of the biggest experiences of our life when we haven't had that conditioning to begin with for the whole of our lives? Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. so many places to start, right? When we're talking about, well, how do we change this? How do we shift this around? Mm-hmm. We shift it around first by how we are in relationship with our own body as mothers, right? And then as we grow out of our family's homes and we're learning this information perhaps for the first time, then we have to grieve what we have not been taught seriously. Mm -hmm. And then we have to take responsibility for what we don't know and understand that we don't know what we don't know because the collective culture has tried to hide it from us because it is our source of power. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, and you're talking about like, how do we try to do something which we never had experience with? Like, how can I give birth uh, connected to myself if my mother, my grandmother, and probably my grand-grandmother sort of never had this experience and uh, yeah one one point is like to know better your body but I'm thinking how could someone really think of a mindset maybe there is something also about the mindset how I can approach this because my birth could be still in a medical environment right and there is a lot of unexpected can happen And I could be physically disconnected with my child without even my consent. And there are many, many things that can happen. So still, what what I can do, what else maybe somebody can do to just think of this? I mean, to me, in the ideal world, what would be happening is like our pregnancies, right, are like more or less 40 weeks long. And to me, like what Mm -hmm. is the most important work that we could do during our pregnancies is to do this work relative to healing the mother line. So it's like women oftentimes in the modern world want to make like birth plans and like, I want this to happen and I want that to happen. Mm -hmm. But most women aren't considering, oh, well, how did my mother give birth? And what about my grandmother and Mm -hmm. my great? Most women aren't considering that. But I'm saying if we pulled in that that inquiry into our pregnancy times. And then we did work during pregnancy with like a pre and perinatal psychologist, right? And Mm -hmm. that was our prenatal care that we could do a lot of the work that binds us, that like enslaves us to this intergenerational um, pattern repetition, Right. So I believe Mm -hmm. that we could unwind that beforehand, before pregnancy, but it's like maybe we don't even think about this till pregnancy. I feel like that should be our prenatal care instead of women having baby showers and even blessing ways. Like, I don't know if you all have blessing ways there. And that's cool, you know, but it's like I've only actually gone to a couple blessing ways. And I was like, we just sat here for like five hours making a beaded necklace for this mom and that's beautiful right everyone's putting their prayer and then the mom wears a necklace and like that has its place but i'm like Mm -hmm. that's a lot of human resource to make a beaded necklace right like Mm -hmm. if we directed all that human resource to whether it's financially or with energy or with time like supporting this mother in her passage into motherhood 
by connecting her with a pre and perinatal psychologist or doing family constellations work or whatever it is to unwind this birth trauma that we all have, this intergenerational birth trauma, then we could literally Mm -hmm. bless the way, clear the path for this mother to arrive at birth without all of this patterning that she doesn't even know she has, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even know that they're carrying all this birth trauma. And I've actually seen more men faint at birth than I've seen women, right? Because Mm -hmm. it's not just that the men are seeing blood or something and they're fainting. It's like all the men are carrying their own birth trauma too. So like how can the Mm -hmm. male partners show up at birth in, in this supportive way that we want them to when they have their own birth trauma too, that they're not even consciously aware of. So it just gets triggered and everyone gets stressed out, including the practitioners in that environment. So everyone's stress and unhealed birth trauma themselves manifests another birth trauma. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we need to do the work ahead of time. Our partners really need to do this work ahead of time. And then we need to choose care practitioners who have done this work too, so that the field of birth, when we get into that space, is as clear as possible. That's what I Mm -hmm. see. Yeah. I'm thinking like from your point of view and from your experience and working with a lot of women, why do we as women, I would say we, bringing myself also there, uh, start to think of this either too late, like five days before birth or suddenly the sudden anxiety or something is happening and we just like oh, I, need, I need something outside of just knowing the birth process and all this stuff that they give you during this birth preparation classes so why is it too late or even after birth after we have a negative experience like traumatic experience and i see a lot of women who like with their second or third child they sort of feel that it was really deeply wrong the first experience and they want to change it and then they start to look for something. So why do you think it's so common uh, scenario right now? I mean, like we could go to so many levels of answering (laughs) that question. But like when I sit with that, you know, and get out of all of the stories, um, really what I get to is like, we must still have something to learn right? Mm. Because things don't change unless we've learned the lesson. And in my work in maternal health, I'm like, we can stop this. We've already done this. We don't need to keep repeating this. And, you know, like I train healthcare practitioners with in postpartum care, right? And then, and then I give to them a community education series that they bring out to their communities to work with pregnant mothers and families to prepare for their postpartum time. And the only women and families around the entire world, okay, that are coming to these classes are those who have had their second, third, you know, fourth child. It's not first time parents because first time parents are like, I don't need that. I'm going to be fine. (laughs) My mom's going to be with me for one week. My husband has five days off of work. And it's only the parents who have gone through it who are like, that was horrible. And I don't want to do that again who come, right? So when it comes to birth and postpartum time and just our experience of being human, I don't think that we often change until we have really hard experiences because we're super stubborn as humans, right? So instead Mm -hmm. of being like, oh, Mm -hmm. look, She just went through that experience. I can learn from that experience too. I don't actually have to go through it. We don't do that. And we just like go Mm -hmm. into it and have the same experience. And so do I agree with the medicalization of birth? No. Do I think it's good, the amount of C-sections that are happening around the world? No. Do I understand the damage that this kind of birth is doing to mothers and babies? Yes. And I also Mm -hmm. can rest in a knowing that if it's happening like this, there must be a reason that it's happening like this to serve the evolution of our consciousness. 
Okay. Because Mm -hmm. if it weren't serving that, I don't believe it wouldn't be happening. So I feel like there must be something that we need to learn collectively from these experiences to shift human consciousness, you know? And I can say that, like I had um, a C-section birth after a four day labor. I'm not saying this from like my pedestal of, you know, midwifery model of care. I'm saying this as someone who has gone through this experience, right? That it's like, Mm -hmm. yes, I believe we are um, victimized by um, the medical establishment. Yes, I know that obstetric violence is real and always happening. Um, Yes, to all of that. And we are also participating in this, right? Because Mm -hmm we are creators as human beings. So if we're participating in this, what is it that we need to learn through these experiences? That's how Mm -hmm. I see that. Yeah. And it's a like super philosophical point of view as well, because Mm -hmm. otherwise it just doesn't make sense. Why is it happening? Like there should be something. So, and talking about the first time mothers and parents, like you have to learn the lesson before you try to find something different, but still Mm -hmm. let's imagine there is someone like who is a first time mother and who is looking for ways and ideas and maybe how, how it could happen. And what is their untold truth about birth that, you know, nobody tells you or People never ask the advice they should ask potentially about this. So is there something that you really would like to share with someone who is a first time future mom? Um, I feel that it's really important when choosing your um, care provider. Like if you are not going to have a free birth, you know, if you're not planning to have an unassisted birth and you're choosing to have a care provider, Mm -hmm. to ask the care provider about their own birth experience. What was their experience being born into this world? And what was their experience giving birth? Because if they look at you like you're crazy and like, what does that have to do with me offering care to you? You know that they have a really big blind spot. Okay. Because, Mm -hmm. and this might be far out weird for people to hear, right? If they're not tapped into the world of pre and perinatal psychology, but how we're born matters, how we're born imprints us for life. We carry all of that. And most women, men too, right? Most people who get into obstetrics or midwifery get into that work because we have our own wounds to heal. Okay. That's just the the truth Mm -hmm. of all things, right? Like we teach what we need to learn. Like anybody who's doing any kind of profession that's offering care, whether it's therapy or massage work or whatever, it's because they have um, some kind of wound that they're working through to heal. And in and of itself, Mm -hmm. that's not the problem if the individual's doing the work. The problem is when those wounds are unconscious, as they are for most birth professionals, They have no idea that that even exists. They have no idea that they got into this work to heal their own selves. And Mm -hmm. so they bring this unhealed trauma with them to every birth they attend. And the anxiety or the fear or whatever it is they experience being born into this world as a baby, not in their conscious mind as an imprint, but in their body mind as an imprint, Mm -hmm. in whatever way they felt when they were giving birth, if they're women, all of that affects them. So their capacity to show up with you or not as a birthing woman in trust in you as a woman is completely dependent upon their relationship to their trust in their self and their own process. So to Mm -hmm. me, like most um, problems, interventions, traumas that are happening at birth are happening because of the care providers. Okay. If I, you know, if I had to make up my own statistic, I would say 95% of birth interventions and traumas is because of the traumas undigested of the care provider themselves. So Mm. I would like to know if I was going to have a birth care provider for myself at this point in time, 
what is your experience in that way? Are you even aware of that? Have you done healing work around that? You know, and then I would like to know about their protocols and what kind of protocols are they upholding? Because even with midwives, most midwives mm -hmm. are upholding legal or state protocols rather than biologically based protocols. So it's important to know that. It's important to know, like in, in the United States, if a woman gets to like 40 weeks, which is the due date, if she gets to 40 weeks in one day, it's like a danger, right? And yes. there is no woman in a hospital in the United States that's going to get to 41 weeks because they will tell you it's an emergency and that you are putting your baby's life in danger and you need to have ultrasound every day to monitor. And if you're not going into labor by 40 weeks and six days, then you need to come in for an induction. And it's like, what is that based upon? It's not, that's not biological truth. Like biological truth is that babies are born anywhere from 35 to 36 weeks of gestation to 44 weeks. How do I know that? Because babies' lungs are done developing in the womb by about 35 to 36 weeks. So then it's okay for them to be born, right? And 44 weeks because I've known many women who have gone to 44 weeks gestation and give birth to normal, healthy, functioning babies and healthy placentas. It's not that your placenta starts to deteriorate when you're 40 weeks and six days, you know? So it's like this range of normal is really only what traditional authentic midwives hold. So it's like mm -hmm. as a birth care provider, are you upholding biological reality or are you upholding you know, man-made, literally man-made, fabricated reality that's not based upon this design, you know? Those are the mm -hmm. things that I think are most important for women to ask their care providers. And then, and then also it's like, how do you feel with this person? Like, you need to feel like you'd be totally good to get naked in front of this person mm -hmm. and do weird things, you know? If you don't feel good with this person enough that you'd feel good to get naked and do weird things. They're not someone that you want to have around you when you're giving birth mm -hmm. because you have to feel safe when you're giving birth, but not safe in this mental construct, safe in your body, you know, mm -hmm. loved and nourished and witnessed, but not observed and monitored and controlled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, uh, is there is a way still to get this positive experience being in the hospital, let's say, uh, and what is needed, like care provider, for sure. But mm -hmm. for example, take Cyprus. It's one of the highest C-section rates country in Europe, maybe the highest one. It's always either second or third, uh, set, uh, second, uh, first or second place. And then there is uh, birth at home is illegal, so you have to go to the hospital. No doula, there are like few doulas and no midwife or doula will assist you if you don't want to go to the hospital. And there are like a couple of private clinics which are quite expensive, let's say. So no, not all people can afford them. So you have to go to this <laughs> fucking hospital. <laughs> uh, they just, you cannot, but it's, it's illegal stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there is something uh, like, and you need to stand up for your like, rights and for your needs and being in this highly vulnerable state of actually bursting at the same time it feels like you have to struggle and you have to fight for for your for the space to happen like what are the any strategies that could help someone in this situation any any ideas like it's difficult, I know, but it's the reality, I think. At the same I mean, time. you know, I personally am not a believer in, like, reforming things, right? Like, if we're saying that most births are happening in the hospital and therefore the care providers are educated in the way that they are, there's no conditions that are actually required for physiologic births to happen it's like, what can you do in there? I mean, bring a diffuser and have it smell good with essential oils. I mean, put on music. It's like, you're not, you're not going to change like these structures that 
are there, you know? And so that's why for me, I feel like it's this time we're living in, it's going to take courage and like focused courage and determination. And really what I feel like it comes down to also is like self-worth to get really freaking creative in how do we, how do we do things, you know? And like, I surely don't know how to solve like the world's problems, but like, I know that in like my specific sphere, it's like it requires this strategizing. It requires us to have that courage and self-love to think outside the box of what we're offered about creative solutions. Because if we say, well, it's like this and so therefore we have to, then like nothing else exists, Mm -hmm. right? So like what to do then? I mean, Maybe there's women coming up who are going to get trained as midwives. Maybe women are going to have more free births. Maybe women need to leave the country to have their babies in peace. Um, I don't know, you know, but I do know that like the time we're living in is going to require us all to get creative because we need a really big change. We need a revolution, okay, Mm -hmm. is what we're talking about. And that's not going to come by like looking around us to see like, oh, well, what exists? And let me like use what exists to create this. Mm -hmm. We need to like get new ideas. You know, Mm -hmm. we need to bring down new ideas and open ourselves up to the potential that other things exist that we haven't even considered, you know, to create the solutions we need. Because I'm in connection with birth and healthcare providers from around the world. And there is places where it is, freaking horrible. I mean, maybe in Cyprus, it's really horrible. In South Africa, it's really fucking horrible. You know, like there's many places in the world where it's insanity, you know, but also for us as women, it's like how much and how long are we going to allow people Mm -hmm. to tell us we can't birth in our own homes who decides that shit? And we're, we're complying with that, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's on us as women to say no, right? But mm-hmm. this is the waking up process, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, you know, and that's what we're in right now. It's the waking mm-hmm. up to this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one more last question on the on the birth and pregnancy, and then I would like to dip a little bit in postpartum, which you have like a hu- huge experience mm-hmm. in. So we talked about hospitals, but also mm-hmm. like, what is the effect of social media and um, the overheard stories around any given woman, let's say? in the birth process, in their preparation, again, in their, in the way they might think of birth. So how do you feel? How does this affect if in any way, what is happening? There's like so many angles that that could be taken on again, right? Because in one sense, I think it's like anything, right? It's like, what channel are you tuned into? Right? So like, You can think about that like with like television, like what channel are you tuned into? Are you watching a bunch of war movies? Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing that all the time. Or are you watching nature documentaries about whales giving birth and migrating? Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you're tuned into social media in the same way, like the social media I'm tuned into, everything related to birth is really beautiful and uplifting And, um, I can feel and track through what I am tuned into, like how things are shifting for the better. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm tuned into that. But like, what if you're tuned in to a different channel? Okay. And Mm -hmm. you're watching horror stories. So it's like, where is our focus going? And so I would say like in general, social media sucks on our focus And our focus Mm -hmm. is our life energy. So like, what are we giving our life energy as our focus to? And if it's things that are uplifting and helping us to heal in some kind of way, then maybe it could be serving a good purpose. If it's things that are creating fear in us, I don't think that's going to serve us so good. If there are things that we're seeing and then we're just feeling bad about ourselves, 
that's not creating anything positive either. So I think it depends on what we're tuned into in general. And then I will say like social media creates is it's a virtual reality, right? Mm -hmm. And I only use social media for my work. And it's something that I've had to like be really conscious of because it's like, this is actually not reality. (laughs) This Mm -hmm. is virtual reality. And our reality is who we actually are in relationship with, you know? Mm -hmm. So if someone's like doing something, saying something bad about me, doing something out in the social media world, and then you can get all triggered and feel some kind of way. But it's like, I don't have a relationship with them anyway. So if I press block on my social media, they Mm -hmm. just disappear and then they don't exist, which is what is true. Like they don't actually exist in my reality. So I feel like, Social media has positive things it can give us, but it also offers us a lot of distortions of truth. Mm. And it all depends on what we're tuned into Mm. and what feelings is it producing in us that we have to have enough awareness to track ourselves. And is that helpful or not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And I feel like uh, on social media, it's always a part of the stories. Like people never give you the whole context and you're just like, oh, that's uh, so such a nice family or such a nice birth or whatever. They're so perfect. What's wrong with me? Uh Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you just, you know, somehow you find out the other aspects of the situation. Like, no, it's not. (laughs) I don't want to be there. Yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. It creates a distorted perception of reality because Mm -hmm. we put people on pedestals. We think they're so great. We think we're pieces of shit because they're so great and we're doing so horrible. But if you don't actually know people person to person, if you never connected with them, if you don't know what they feel like in presence. Yeah, we're getting we're getting percentages of what's real you know Mm -hmm. so it creates all these distortions okay so let's move into the postpartum and um, I've listened several of your videos where you were talking about the importance of first days and like 20 60 days after the birth um, saying that if I understood correctly and correct me if I'm wrong that it sets up uh, in a way, how we're going to parent uh, the child later on. So this is a super important part. And I'm thinking that, you know, quite often we, especially as a new moms, we like think, okay, what kind of clothes I need to buy? Like what, what kind of, uh, you know, bed, it's uh, all this stuff, which doesn't have anything with what you're going to encounter in real life. Like you, you don't give a shit about the clothes because there is something much bigger and complex and challenging. Mm-hmm. So uh, could you explain a little bit more? What do you mean? Like why these days are so important? And again, what would be your advice probably on how to focus the attention during those days? So... Like all postpartum traditions that I've encountered, and I've encountered many, 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 many of them. So I can say um, that it's a global uh, understanding. Um, All postpartum traditions have like overlapping premises, right? So it doesn't matter if the postpartum tradition is coming from Mexico or from Russia or from the South Pacific Islands or from China or whatever, all of the postpartum traditions are saying the same thing. They're all saying you have a big lying in period, which literally means the mom is in bed with her baby, right? Being taken care of. She gets up, she goes to the bathroom on her own and like that. But her work during like the first about six weeks after birth is to rest and to heal and to establish her breastfeeding relationship with her baby Mm-hmm. Um, another cross-cultural teaching is relative to the kind of food we eat. All postpartum traditions teach the same things to eat. They're different. Yes, because the land, the environment is different place to place, but it's all 
warm in nature, warm in temperature, easy to digest, nutrient-dense food after birth. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. All of them talk about the importance of body work for the mother after birth. All of them talk about the importance of warmth in temperature, warmth in everything after birth. And all of those things in the postpartum time, right, can only happen if there's community. Because Mm -hmm. from a very practical standpoint, to the deeper understandings of who we are as human beings, dependent on each other for co-regulation, um, postpartum care can only happen within the context of community, which brings us to the modern day current conundrum. What do most people not have is community. So then it's like, you know, then there we are, right? So, yeah. so the reason, right, that these traditions exist is because they're based in the physiologic design of a postpartum woman. They're not just like good ideas or lofty ideals. Like what my work is, um, what I did that I bring out through what I call innate postpartum care is like the translation of all of these postpartum traditions into understanding that it's all based upon our physiologic needs. Okay, that's why Mm -hmm. they're the same throughout the whole world. So then what Mm -hmm. are the physiologic needs of a postpartum woman, right? And when we understand that these traditions were created to meet the actual needs, not like just wants or desires or lofty ideals or whatever, but the actual needs of the postpartum woman, it's Mm -hmm. to understand that it is with this level of nourishment and nurturance that this mother was able to optimally heal on all levels after mm. growing a human being and birthing a human being through her body. And then through about six weeks of this type of nurturance and nourishment, this mother could come up mm-hmm. um, empowered, feeling so good, feeling so nourished, feeling so strong through being taken care of so deeply that she could then best mother her child, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's to understand that these these postpartum traditions aren't based on like altruism, like, oh, we're doing this for the mother simply because of worship of mother, although there is that too, but it's the understanding Mm -hmm. of reciprocity. It's the understanding that the community is invested in the health and well-being of the mothers because that mother is mothering the future generation of that community. So the mm-hmm. community is invested in the mother because the mother is invested in the community ultimately, mm-hmm. right? It's a reciprocal mm-hmm. thing. And that's embedded mm-hmm. in that, okay? Mm-hmm. So we're living in a time where we have forgotten how to live in reciprocity. We have forgotten the right order of life. We have forgotten um, so many things that we're repairing right now that we're piecing back together, right? But the understanding is, is that how mothers are tended to in that early postpartum time is going to affect her long-term health, okay? So it's the acknowledgement that pregnancy and birth is such a tremendously resource intensive period, even just on the physical level without tapping into all of the other levels and how a woman is replenished, right, in her postpartum time is going to determine how healthy she is going forward. So what Mm -hmm. most of us are accustomed to seeing in the modern world is like, having a baby, either either we see this or we experience this, we have a baby, and then we're all fucked up, right? We're depleted, we feel bad, we develop autoimmune conditions. It's like women are just a fucking mess, okay? And so then we think, well, then that's normal because it's common, right? So it's common Mm -hmm. and therefore becomes normalized, but it's not normal because there still exist places in the world where women receive this kind of care, like in India, right, where the Ayurvedic postpartum tradition is still intact. And and you can also talk with women who are like in their 90s or even past 100 years old who had seven children but received this level of intensity of postpartum care, and they're mm-hmm. in radiant health, okay? And so there's so many levels as to why that is, right, which is relative to Um, our hormones and the repairing process that needs to happen after growing and birthing human life. 
But there's also the imprinting that happens, like from a neurological perspective. Everything that I've read, it says that it takes between like 20 to 60 days for us to create new neural pathways in our brain. So Mm -hmm. like if we're trying to break a habit or create a new habit, right? This is the amount of days that it takes to create actual hard wiring so that like we follow through with these habits. And Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a coincidence that the world's postpartum traditions are between 20 to 60 days long because it's creating new hardwiring in the mother's brain. It's an imprinting of ah, to be a mother means to be nourished, means to be taken care of. Yeah, you're saying this and I feel like it's not like you have to struggle and you have to get through this somehow. Right. It's actually something completely opposite. Yes. And like most of us received that imprinting of like to be a mother means you're alone. You have to figure this shit out on your own. It feels really bad emotionally. You feel like something's wrong with you and it's a struggle. And so like, that's the imprint, right? That that's, mm-hmm. that's the hard wiring that's created when we're in this moment of like the most neuroplasticity that we'll be in, in our lives is like in pregnancy and birth. Okay. Mm-hmm. So our brains are being reconfigured through our mothering and we're being fucking hardwired to believe that mothering is equivalent to struggle and degeneration, right? Mm-hmm because Mm -hmm. that's how our postpartum periods are. And they're meant to be like delicious and nourishing. And they're meant to, to make a woman feel like she's being reborn. That's what Mm -hmm. is meant to happen through a supported postpartum period. Thank you. Thank you, Mm -hmm. Rochelle. I think our time is over. (laughs) It's uh, almost. I'm okay to stay for a a couple more minutes if you want. Like if you had some. I had a question about depression and anxiety, but I think you talked about this already. Oh no, we should we should talk about that because that's... yeah. Okay, perfect. So, my basically my take on that was that so 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 many women feel really pissed off and bad and guilty and anxious and what, what all the dark feelings after giving birth. So why this is happening and you know what what's what's the root cause of this? The root cause is lack of support and lack of nourishment mm-hmm. and lack of community. So it's a reframe on the way that it's talked about in the collective culture amongst mothers, amongst healthcare professionals, amongst mental health professionals, right? It's like postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety and postpartum rage. And I'm saying, what if the depression that we feel in the postpartum time, the anxiety that we feel, the rage that we feel are healthy, normal responses actually to dysfunctional environments, okay? Mm. Because the problem is the environment, The pathologizing is of women, of women's bodies, okay? So the patterning set up within allopathic medicine, the patterning that is within our minds across the world is what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me for feeling like this? I shouldn't feel like this. I should feel some other way. But it's like you look at nature, as our example for everything. And if there's a flower in the garden, right? And the flower, you know, is wilting and it's kind of ugly, you know, we don't go over to the flower and think or say to the flower, what the hell is wrong with you, flower? Stand up, you know, like you're supposed to be really beautiful, No, we say, oh my gosh, I've forgotten to water you, you know, and oh my gosh, all these weeds have grown over you. So you've been getting no sun, Mm -hmm. right? And it's the same thing for mothers, right? Like, so the, the inter it's what it is. Why we do this as women is because it's internalized oppression. Okay. So like all the hundreds and thousands of fucking years of patriarchy, what we've done is we've like sucked it all in and we believe it. And so then when something feels off, 
that we could use as a barometer, as in Mm -hmm. this feels off, something's not right. What can I do to create a change? Something feels off and we say, something must be wrong with me. That's internalized Mm -hmm. depression, okay, as women. And so, and then our healthcare providers reflect that back to us. Something's wrong with you. You need Mm -hmm. to go on medication, Okay. Mm -hmm. How many women are on um, SSRIs right now? I don't even know the statistic. Before the whole COVID time, like 30% of women in the United States were on anti-anxiety or anti-depression medication or both. I would reckon now it's probably like 50% or more. Okay. would be my Mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. And, And so what I'm saying is that those feelings that we feel, we feel depressed, we feel anxious, we feel whatever it is that comes up for us in the postpartum time is the brilliance actually of our bodies letting us know that this is not okay, right? What is not okay? Our environments are not okay. It's not okay and normal to be alone all day with a newborn baby or with our small children for that matter. That's not normal. I know a lot of us are doing that out of need, but we're not going to feel good in that circumstance because we're wired to co-regulate as Mm -hmm. humans. Where Mm -hmm. are the adults that we're co-regulating with? There are studies out there about the impact of loneliness on individuals. Mm -hmm. There's no specific studies about the impact of loneliness on postpartum mothers because who's going to fund that research, right? But Mm -hmm. it's like there are studies out there, you know, that say it is more damaging to our health to be lonely as a human being than it is to be an alcoholic, than it is Mm -hmm. to be morbidly obese, than it is to smoke several packs of cigarettes a day. Okay, that's how damaging loneliness is on our cardiovascular system, on our immune Mm -hmm. system, on our hormonal system. So the biggest antidote to how we feel in the postpartum period is relative to community. Like, do we Mm -hmm. have humans who can be with us, who we can be with on a daily basis, who can accurately um, reflect back to us who we are, meaning not your mother-in-law or your own mother who has a distorted perception of who you are and is going to feed that back to you, but someone who can see your true nature and be with you in that. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing in the postpartum time. And the thing of postpartum depression and anxiety and all these things is complete bullshit and it's um, lack of nourishment of postpartum mothers. Mm. And I love what you say that the, these feelings of depression, anxiety, or rage, whatever it is, is it could be your sort of like like a not a guideline, but something that you can actually see further, like not internalizing this something wrong and feeling shame and guilt and whatever, mm-hmm. which is a very common pattern, at least for me and I think for many. Mm-hmm. But looking outwards and see what actually needs to be changed outside. It's not something wrong about me, but I think it's such an uncommon way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I'm also not saying that it's always like to externalize our problems, right? Because that also could like put us into the place of the victim. Yeah. But it's also to see like, what do I need to change inside of myself for this to change, right? Because there's also the truth of like, we're learning something really important through what it is that we're experiencing. So it's looking to the environment, but also what is it in us that allowed us, that created this environment that we're Mm -hmm. in that's not nourishing to us, right? And that has to do with what we have come to accept. It's like we've come to accept like breadcrumbs as Mm -hmm. women, you know, morsels, instead of like the loaf of bread, you know, it's come from lack of self-love, lack of self-respect, lack of self-honoring. So there's like the inside outside work to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I have one last question, but it's not, uh, 
if you don't want to again to comment it's okay we can stop here so you can I ask it to... might as well just go yeah back. okay yeah the last one is about uh, the topic of like women's authenticity and freedom and all this and i think it feels like a new trend of like you have to be being authentic you have to sort of you know do this or that it's like something as before it was let's say you have to do business or you know you have to do you you have to be pretty or whatever mm -hmm. like being authentic becomes something like again a new imposed norm so what's your take on this what you feel is like women's authenticity and freedom mm -hmm. yeah i mean i understand what you're saying they're like fads and there's like the superficial distorted fads like on social media right um and how they're presented and all the things you know so totally and of course i believe that we should be authentic you know like that's what i feel like we're here to do is to be authentic human mm -hmm. beings and i do feel like as women in particular you know we're coming out of hundreds thousands of years of oppression on the planet for who we are which is powerful creator goddesses in these bodies you know and so i do feel like we have our um work cut out for us as women right to to feel good you know to say it easy to to feel like a fully expressed woman and whatever that means for the individual you know so i do feel like it's a both and thing you know where it's mm -hmm. like yes because Um, I think things come up into the collective, like now it's time for this to be tended and now it's time for this. So I feel like there is part of that. And then there's a the part that's like, you know, it's like I, I joke about it with friends all the time. Like, you know, the the 22 year old life coach. Right. And it's like, what life are you coaching from? You know, like what life experience are you coaching from as a life coach mm -hmm. or like you know, the 19 year old, um, you know, mother essence, feminine empowerment. And you're like, what? Like, you need to actually like learn that and embody that first. It's, you know, before you can teach that, but this is just like the modern day distortion confusion mm -hmm. thing that's being spun out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Um, I think just to comment on what you're saying that it's so important. I started to feel it only now how important it is to have like elder women somewhere around you to just see the examples and how do they do things. And only, you know, with with years of life, you understand that it's just, you know, you, you, you couldn't come up to this like when you've been 20. It's just impossible. Totally. You have to live it. Yeah. Yeah. So Rochelle, thank you so much. I really appreciate the conversation. It's uh, I feel like a therapy for myself for you know for this topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask a question because I wanted to register for the membership on your website, and it mm -hmm. says that there is a waiting list, right? So it's correct. You just put your email and. Are you going to open something for Oh, so the membership thing I have is only for past students. So like yeah, okay. that's the only way I do membership. And then um, mm. like the thing that's open up to the public is when I do like my baby care class that's coming okay. up in January and, you know, a Nate's training that I'll start September of next year. And I have some other okay. things going on. I got, I got very curious in this circle ideas and I mm -hmm. saw that, oh, maybe I could join to some circle of women oh, and be uh, with someone but i just don't know it's it works only for those who want to then teach right no those who have gone through my program through innate postpartum mm -hmm. cares training so it's just for those mm -hmm. who have like gone through my nine month training and then mm -hmm. like want to stay on together for like mm -hmm. mentorship and connection and this training is for health care professionals Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. birth and health okay. care providers mm -hmm. okay okay so that's not me but maybe at some point in time you will open up yeah. something for the <laughs> for the broader public yeah. thank you Rochelle so uh yeah. was lovely to yeah. to be connected with you <laughs> yeah with you too bye okay bye bye